Hey guys, welcome back. Well, I finally got a few minutes to do some testing with this Uniguide 50. I talked about this sometime back when I first got it and provided a little bit of an overview on the scope, but I haven't actually gotten around to using it until just lately. I did want to do a test using the Uniguide 50 so I could compare it to the guiding I'm getting with my off-axis guider. First of all, mounting the Uniguide 50 to the main scope, particularly if you have a William Optic scope, is very easy because the William Optics are designing their handles now with a Vixen style interface so that the Uniguide just slides right in. They give you the thumb screws to lock it in place and it's a very solid connection and uh, there's no problem there whatsoever. Of course you can have a problem if you're trying to use the Uniguide 50 with other scopes and you don't have ready access to a Vixen style interface. And one of the things that's a little irritating uh, about the Uniguide 50 is that there are no attachment holes here. You, know, you might expect to see a series of quarter 20 or M6 threaded holes here so that you could mount it to some other scope. Unfortunately, that's not the case. So the only way to really mount this scope to another scope is using a Vixen style interface. And in here, I have one that I, I bought from ZWO. It's a little Vixen style uh, mounting plate, but it does increase the complexity and the cost of dealing with this guide scope because you've got to provide that additional mounting hardware if you don't already have access to that. Focusing with the Uniguide 50, I found to be pretty easy. There's a couple of options here and kind of the steps that I use, I did the focusing outside at night on stars before the moon came up. The first thing I did was to unscrew the dew shield a bit. The, uh, the dew shield screws in and screws out to permit some focusing and there's a good bit of travel here, but I rotated the dew shield out about five to 10 millimeters and then I slid the camera in and out a bit to try to get to rough focus. It's difficult to find focus with this uh, arrangement because you're holding the camera with one end and then you need to turn that gold uh, locking ring with the other and it's very difficult to hold the fine focus with one hand while you're moving with the other hand and then lock the ring in place and then go back to the dew shield and rotate it. There's a good bit of friction in this interface, which is actually good. It's very easy to just rotate it into place. Once you get it to where you want it, then you just rotate the locking ring at the forward end and lock the dew shield in place. And I find that that works pretty well. And on the night that I was doing the focusing, I had Vega in view, which is not the best focus uh, star, but there are a couple of other uh, you may not be able to see them, but there are a couple of other pinpoint stars in here. And when I was doing this testing, this is what the moon looks like in the field of view of this guide scope and, in this case, the guide camera. The guide camera is not an ideal guide camera that I'm doing this test with. It's the ASI 120 uh, MC, so it's the color camera, USB 3 camera. I have the USB 2 version, but it's serving as a paperweight now. Thank you, ZWO, for that. So I think the best way to approach focusing with this guide scope is to slide the camera in and out for a coarse focus, and then to rotate the dew shield for a fine focus, and then you can lock both into place, and then you're good to go. This is the system I'm using. I've got my William Optics GT81. It's 385 millimeter focal length uh, with the focal reducer field flattener that's in here. I've got the off-axis guider is what I usually use. This is the ZWO off-axis guider. And in this case, this is the ASI 290 guide camera. It's a nice camera, small pixel size. So that's a, it's a good choice for a guide camera. And then up here, of course, I've got the Uniguide 50 mounted on top, and you can see the ASI 120 has the USB 3 connection back into the ultimate power box here. The pixel scale is a, is a big consideration in guiding. Maybe not at this shorter focal length of my GT81, but certainly as you get up into longer focal lengths, the pixel scale of your guider, you want to be as small as possible to uh, make sure you can make corrections on the scale of a pixel in your imaging camera. And in this case, it's not that big of a deal uh, because the uh, I've got such a, a short focal length on the imaging side. But for comparison here, the off-axis guider pixel scale is 1.55 arc seconds per pixel, whereas in the case of the Uniguide, I've got 3.87 arc seconds per pixel. And the Uniguide is suffering from two things. One, it's got a, sh a, uh, a shorter focal length, so the, with the off-axis guider, you are by definition looking through the main scope. So you get the benefit of that 385 millimeters focal length of the main scope. 
For the Uniguide 50, it's a 200 millimeter scope, so that's a that's a hit right there on pixel scale. And the second thing is, I'm using a guide camera, the ASI 290, which has a smaller pixel size than the ASI 120. So that's another hit on uh, pixel scale, and that's why there's such a big difference between the pixel scale for my off-axis guider and the uh, versus the Uniguide 50. So in this case. Uh, in this particular feature comparison, certainly the off-axis guider wins out, as it will most of the time when you are comparing a off-axis guider to a dedicated independent guide scope. On the advantage side, though, as I say, is the pixel scale for the off-axis guider, but the Uniguide 50 has an advantage in the sense that you can see more stars. It's a broader field of view, and so when you're using the multi-star guiding algorithm in PHD2, you're picking from uh, many stars and you're picking from stars across a larger field of view which means you're doing a better job of averaging out the effects of seeing so that's really the the battle here is between the broader field of view and more stars across that field of view for the Uniguide 50 versus the off-axis guider and its finer pixel scale on the disadvantage size the off-axis guider by definition is looking at the perimeter of the light cone coming in from the main scope and as a result if you don't have a perfectly flat field your your guide stars are going to be somewhat oval looking also if there's a bit of tilt in the connection between the off-axis guide camera and the off-axis guider as there can be there's just one set screw in this case holding it in place uh, that can also introduce some some uh, deformation into the star and on the Uniguide 50 well the the advantage of the OAG is the pixel scale well that's a disadvantage of the Uniguide 50 it's going to be suffering from a larger pixel scale on the cost side they're comparable uh, but you might be surprised to see that the off-axis guider is actually a cheaper option than the Uniguide 50 at $163 I put plus a few dollars in there because you don't know what your attachment uh, specific attachment scenario will be if you're attaching it as I am here to a William Optics scope that has the Vixen style handle then it's just $163 and you're good to go if you've got to buy that Vixen style interface for another scope then you've got that extra hardware cost to factor in when you consider the price of these two but nominally they are about equal all things considered does the availability of more stars outweigh the smaller pixel scale of the off-axis guider on the night that I made these comparisons that I'm going to be showing you that was on November 15th this is the day before the night before and I was using my off-axis Axis guider exclusively over a period of a little over nine hours of pure imaging time. I would start out on one target, uh, in this case the uh, Flying Bat Nebula, then switch over to a second target, the Lobster Claw, then switch over to a third target, the uh, Heart Nebula, and then follow the Heart Nebula down to low on the horizon and also as the sun is coming up. What I'm doing is going back to the guide log, and I may do a video on this in the future, and uh, pulling out the guide data over a 400 second period in each successive 400 second period so in other words here's the gut this point right here represents the guiding for that particular image meanwhile this point down here represents the total pointing error for that particular image and so in each 400 second increment i would go through and essentially calculate the uh, rms guiding for uh, each sub-exposure throughout the night. We normally speak of pointing error as, uh, oh, it's 0.5 arc seconds, it's 0.7 arc seconds. It's, well, it's not any one of those. <laughs> it's all of those. And in this case, you can see that I've been very pleased with the guiding of this EQ6R mount, but you can see here that it's it, there's quite a bit of variability over the course of a night. I can be as good as uh, 0.4 arc seconds RMS, and I can be as bad as 0.85 arc seconds RMS. And you can see, particularly in this last target, as the trend was increasing guide error, as the altitude of the target decreased, and I was getting closer to the horizon, also possibly the sun coming up, the guiding got progressively worse as I was looking through more atmosphere and possibly even a brighter atmosphere. The signal-to-noise ratio, for example, of the stars would tend to decrease as, as we approach morning. But I think this kind of gives you a sense of what the guiding has been like with the off-axis guider, with this mount, uh, more or less during the same time period that we'll be making this comparison. By and large, I'm kind of hovering in the 0.5 to 0.6 
range with this mount and the off-axis guider. This is the ZWO off-axis guider over here and this is just a snapshot of the PHD2 guide screen as I was seeing it that night and just to walk through a couple of points here first of all uh, there are multiple stars visible here in this image it is a it's a small prism that we're looking at but we also have the benefit of a small focal length 385 millimeters for the GT81 so there are multiple stars you can see that the star is not as round as you might prefer it to be uh, it the field of the GT81 is pretty flat. I'm sure there's also some tilt associated with this interface. In the case of an off-axis guider, you're quite likely to be dealing with star shapes up here that are not uh, fully round because you are picking those stars from the outer perimeter of the uh, of the light cone. This is the star uh, half flux diameter as it determines it from uh, this image here and it's about 5.65 it doesn't really mean anything but i could say we'll compare that in a bit but of course the main reason we're here and looking at this is the guide performance and in this case i got 0.78 total uh, arc seconds rms error which is fairly high considering my performance throughout the past several nights had been probably hovering between around 0 0.5, 0 0.6. But you saw in the previous graph that it, there's quite a bit of variability over the course of the night, and I may have just taken this snapshot at one of those times. You know, over the past several nights, I'd say the, the guiding was somewhere around the 0.5 to 0.7 range. In the case of the Uniguide 50, when I switched to this guide scope, I've got to recalibrate, and the calibration data look great. Okay, it's nice and orthogonal, no inconsistencies the each data point falls along the line so that's uh, that was good news I'm confident that I had a good uh, calibration at this stage and now about an, this is about an hour or so after uh, the guiding I was doing with the off-axis guiders it's the same night but it's a different target an hour to an hour and a half later and in this case you can see that there's a ton of stars that I can see and because it's a 200 millimeter scope I'm getting those stars distributed over a much wider area of the sky and therefore making much better use of the multi-star guiding algorithm the star here is is nice and round this is a little bit of a deviation from the off-axis guider where you might have some tilt or some image or field of view uh, flatness issues that might tend to extend those stars out so you get a nice round guide star and you'll also notice that the half flux diameter is quite a bit less but that's because I've gone from a 385 millimeter scope down to a 200 millimeter scope so that's what's causing the difference in the half flux diameter now of course the big thing that we're interested in here is how's the guiding and the guiding is pretty darn good uh, here again like I say it's about an hour later but again uh, guiding can change rapidly within a period of an hour up and down and in this case I'm getting uh, pretty good guiding at 0.65 total arc seconds RMS so uh, certainly no complaints here it's better than what I saw in that previous chart for the off-axis guider I don't know that this represents a consistent comparison of the uh, Uniguide 50 relative to an off-axis guider but certainly there's nothing uh, in these results to suggest the guiding is is poorer because of the shorter focal length it looks like uh, for all intents and purposes the multi-star guiding is uh, compensating for that loss of focal length with the guide scope all in all you got to be pretty happy with the guiding performance of the Uniguide 50. first of all the Uniguide 50 obviously is going to be easy to mount to a William Optics main scope where their handle is designed to mate up with the Vixen style interface of the Uniguide 50 and I found it quite easy to focus the two methods using the camera to slide in and out for a coarse focus and the do shield to make the fine focus adjustment. The guiding performance with the Uniguide 50 is on par with if not better than an off-axis guider with a 385 millimeter main scope. If I were to take an ASI 290 with its smaller pixels and a monochrome camera and pair it with the Uniguide 50, I would think you could probably get away with that pairing for a main scope focal length up to about 1400 millimeters and I'm kind of basing that on PhD2's comments that they are able to issue guiding commands for errors of one-tenth of a pixel in the guide camera. And so if I back that off a little bit, be a little more conservative and say instead of one-tenth of a pixel, say one-fifth of a pixel, then as long as your guider pixel scale is less than about five times your imaging pixel scale, you can be issuing guiding commands on the same scale as your imaging 
camera is seeing. Uh, the cost of the UniGuide uh, 50 is a little bit more uh, than an off-axis guider, but not that much. You might want to consider how much it's going to cost to attach the UniGuide 50 to your scope if you don't already have a Vixen style interface available. More than likely, if you're using a UniGuide 50, you're going to pair this with a shorter focal length telescope, which means the star field is going to be fairly rich because you're going to be taking pictures of nebula instead of galaxies. The feature about an off-axis guide that scares a lot of people away is how difficult is it going to be to find a guide star. I've never had a problem finding a guide star uh, up to what I use this off-axis guide with, which is a 700 millimeter telescope so as long as you're in that range you're not going to have any issue at all finding a guide star i'm going to stick with the off-axis guider but for those of you wondering about the uniguide 50 it certainly works well i have no complaints about it whatsoever and if you're using it with a william optic scope then it's going to be easy to mount to it and you won't have any problems there it's a very solid mounting with the william optic scope okay guys well that's enough experimenting for now thanks for showing up and i'll talk to you later see ya